And um, without further ado, my dear friends, I think we're here, all of us, for, um, for one main reason, and that is to listen to uh, Professor Elam Papi, whom I'm sure many of you know, but nonetheless, allow me to introduce. He's the author of Lobbying for Zionism. He's an Israeli historian and socialist activist. He is a professor of history at the College of Social Sciences and International Studies at Exeter University. He's the director of, university, of the university's European Center for Palestine, Palestinian Studies and co-director of the Exeter Center for Ethno-Political Studies. Professor Pape is the author of several books, including the best-selling The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, which is an, an incredible one of my favorites and something I would definitely recommend for those who haven't already read it. Uh, also published by One World. A, Hi a History of Modern Palestine, published by Cambridge University. The, Isra the Israel-Palestine Question by Rutledge. The Forgotten Palestinians, A History of the Palestinians in Israel by Yale. And with Noam Chomsky, Gaza in Crisis, Reflections on Israel's War Against the Palestinians, published by Penguin. Now, before I hand over to him, I believe that we are all fully aware of the catastrophe that is unfolding hour by hour before our very eyes. We're not talking about, I mean, Ilan Pape is, well, is a well-known historian, but we're not talking today necessarily about something which is in the folds of history. We're talking about something that is very, very current. And the roots of which, and I believe that more and more people have come to recognize and acknowledge the roots of which are matters which Professor Pape, as well as many others, have documented and have written about for decades now, including, by the way, our own Dr. Dawood Abdullah, as well as, obviously, Dr. Ghada Karmi and Professor Masalha. So it's not, these aren't secrets, these aren't unknowns. However, it seems that something as tragic as Gaza over the past eight months was required so that people start to ask the pertinent questions, the real questions, and to pose the real arguments. I won't take too, um, I won't take any uh, much more time, but uh, I would like to invite Professor Elan Pape to speak for approximately 30 to 35 minutes. So please, <coughs> Professor Pape. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anas. Uh, thank you, the Cordova Foundation, uh, Middle East Monitor, the Halal Center. Special thanks to my dear friends, Rada and Noor, for sharing uh, the podium, and Dr. Uh, Daoud Abdallah, and One World for enabling me to publish this book. I'm particularly moved by having the friends here with me on the panel. I think I met Rada in 1981 for the first time. You can calculate the years. We don't want to <laughs> calculate the years. We met at the House of Parliament of all places by an event, I don't know if you remember Rada, mm -hmm. organized by the Spectator uh, with the PLO representative at the time. Uh, I, Rada was aware of something I wasn't aware when we met, when I told her, because she liked much of what I said already in 1981, and I said to her, you see, not all the Zionists are bad. And Rada said to me, you might not be a Zionist, but you don't know it. And it took some time uh, before I realized myself that actually the, the views I expressed could not have been defined as Zionist uh, ideas, but it took time for me to liberate myself from that ideology. And uh, as already mentioned, uh, I uh, rather appeared again uh, in the book. Uh, and at the time in the UK, when it was very difficult to speak for Palestine, to stand for Palestine, uh, and it took a lot of courage and a lot of effort and commitment to insist that Palestine should be represented in the public domain, in the media, in politics. and. Uh, we are standing on wide shoulders today uh, due to the in immense and incredible work by activists like Dr. Radha Karmi. Uh, 
It gives me also a great pleasure to see my dear friend Noor. I was trying to remember when I met you first, but it's also in the very distant uh, <laughs> past. Although Noor and I were born not far away from each other geographically, I think we only met outside of Palestine. Uh, and uh, what I do remember is uh, that Noor and I participated in a very naive effort by our dear friend, Edward, the late Edward Said. He was sometimes naive. He brought Israeli and Palestinian historians to Paris in 1999. We won't mention the names of Israeli historians. 97. In 97. In Paris. Yeah. In Paris. And he uh, thought that there was a common ground to, to agree about the version of history, if you remember, no. And he was deeply, deeply disappointed that there was no common ground. And this is important. For him, it was important because at that time, together with Daniel Bernbaum, may he live long, uh, they thought that they found a recipe for coexistence that was not very relevant to the reality on the ground. And Dr. Daoud, I think you, you invited me many years ago for a conference in London, and it was for me the first experience of being introduced to the world of the Muslim community in Britain, and it's very special commitment <coughs> Uh, and devotion to the Palestine question. It opened for me a new world of uh, alliances, friendships, uh, and winning the confidence of the community is something I really cherish and appreciate. And uh, without the help of this community, it would have been very difficult for me to withstand the kind of pressures that all of us uh, are witnessing when we speak freely and truthfully for uh, Palestine. So thank you all for being here, and I really appreciate it. I uh, wanted to write this book because of a conundrum that really interested me and intrigued me over the years. How come a state that is declared to be a high-tech state with the strongest army in the Middle East, with the full support of the United States and the West, still tries to advocate for its legitimacy so many years after. Why is this lack of certainty by the state itself and whoever represents it that maybe its legitimacy is questioned on the one hand? On the other hand, why the Palestinian case and cause, which is very simple in many ways and very easy to understand as a basic moral issue still does not succeed to become a legitimate cause in so many places where decisions are made, where policies are pursued. Uh, and uh, I thought that this kind of conundrum needs uh, not a soundbite answer, which usually we, we need to give under the pressure of media and so on, but maybe I need to go back in history and very uh, slowly reconstruct the history of lobbying for Zionism to try and understand why today we are where we are. And this is why I <coughs> apologize for the length of the book. I know that many people don't like to read books at all, and many people don't like to read long books. Uh, there's sometimes people who prefer just to look at the screen of the smartphone. Uh, it's not an SMS book. Um, but I do hope that uh, the, the patient will pay because you need to really go step by step from the beginning to understand the longevity of the lobby, its effectiveness, but maybe hopefully also realize its deficiencies and weaknesses so that we have a hopeful vision for the future and not just lament all the time what true is true the total imbalance of power on the ground, in the region, in, in the global system that explains why we are where we are uh, uh, today. Another reason for the ra rather length, uh, 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 length of the book is the fact that I wanted to bring long citations uh, from British and American politicians in particular, both those who supported Zionism but also those who oppose Zionism. It's amazing to read statements by both sides of the uh, argument from 1900 or 1905, which are really prophetic. 
are really prophetic in the sense of understanding what the uh, support for a Jewish state in Palestine would do to the Palestinians and to the area as a whole, understanding what kind of complication it would create for the Jewish communities wherever they are. So you have these people with you know, ability which is incredible at a given moment in history to see beyond the moment, to see into the future, and it gives you in a sense, and I think Anas that uh, uh, connects well to what you were saying, that we are still in that historical uh, chapter. It's not, we don't have a closure for that uh, chapter, and I could call this chapter the Western idea that the problem of the Jews in the West can only be solved by colonizing Palestine at the expense of the Palestinians, and how would we continue to defend this horrible idea and uh, uh, give uh, immunity to its uh, practices and policies against the Palestinians, wherever they are. And although I was familiar myself with, with many chapters uh, in the history both of Palestine and of Zionism, uh, I was still uh, uh, surprised to be reminded of certain uh, stages in the progress of the lobbying for Zionism, which really ring true today and relevant uh, today. For instance, the fact that Zionism began as an evangelical Christian project before it became a Jewish one. That the whole idea that the return of the Jews to Palestine is part of a divine scheme that will precipitate the second coming of the Messiah, the resurrection of the dead, and maybe the beginning of 1,000 years of Jesus' rule on, on earth. Now, it was not every evangelical stream in thinking that thought that way, but it was an, an important part of evangelical Christianity, beginning in Britain and transformed into the United States by people at, who at first, you could call them theologians rather than politicians, but very soon some of them became politicians of importance, and they, especially in Britain, they provided a certain theological justification for a new imperial thinking, not just about Palestine, but of the whole Eastern Mediterranean, the Mashrek. Because the British uh, uh, basic view on the Eastern Mediterranean throughout the 19th century was that although the Ottoman Empire that ruled that area was in decline, it was better to keep it intact because a disintegration of the empire would create a, a, a struggle for spoils among the European powers and could lead to something which would be called later on a world war, which in fact is what, what happened. But the pressure of those evangelical Christians who, who together with British imperialists, who thought that it's time to cede from the Ottoman Empire the Eastern Mediterranean brought together, first of all, a non-Jewish support for the idea of what they would call the return of the Jews to Palestine and the replacement of the Palestinian with a Jewish kingdom or state or republic, depends on who we are talking about. Now, it means that already throughout the 19th century, people were discussing the fate of Palestine and the Palestinians without the Palestinians being aware that they are becoming a regional project or even a global project of colonization. And I was surprised to see how much this kind of thinking influenced the early Jewish uh, supporters of Zionism because I would thought that this was were kind of two discrete projects that had nothing to do with it. But then I, I read uh, a diary by one of the most important early Zionist, Eliezer ben Yehuda, who in, reinvented the Hebrew language, he was very much influenced by evangelical Christianity and changed his mind about Zionism in the sense that he said, yes, we, might, we should redefine Judaism, not as a religion, but as a nationalism, but I think they're right. It should happen in Palestine and not anywhere else. So 
there was an impact of that kind of thinking, the imperial thinking, the theological thinking, coming from Christianity on the very nascent, very small number of Jewish intellectuals who thought that the best solution for anti-Semitism in Central and Eastern Europe was to uh, create or establish a Jewish state uh, in, in Palestine. So that's the beginning which, as you can probably understand today, is not just an intellectual uh, or an interesting forgotten chapter of the past. It's still a very relevant alliance that is still working today. By the way, not only in the United States, where we are all familiar with the term Christian Zionist uh, as a lobby that supports Israel. You go to Sweden, you go to Denmark, you go to Norway. Uh, Christian Zionism is alive in Europe and in the United Kingdom as well as, as an idea that uh, uh, supports Israel unconditionally in the name of the same theology that began the whole Zionist project. To my surprise, when I was in Malaysia, I met leaders of the Christian community in Malaysia, and they also are very much under the influence of Christian Zionists uh, uh, in, in that respect. So this is uh, an alliance of the past that is still steadfast uh, 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 today. The second, uh, uh, again, note in the book that reminded me of things that I've forgotten and I thought are very relevant for today is the insistence of every leading finger, fi figure sorry, in the Anglo-Jewish community and also in some of the Western uh, Jewish communities, people with uh, status, with position, some of them ministers in, in cabinet, some of them important business figures in their society. I was surprised to be reminded that they made sure that everybody would understand that they themselves would never go to Palestine, that they felt safe in Britain, that they saw no reason whatsoever to create a Jewish state because they had a problem as an Anglo-Jewish community, and far worse, and most cynically, and most sinisterly, they said if there won't be a Jewish state in Palestine, the poor Jews that are subjected to anti-Semitism in Central and Eastern Europe would come to Britain. God forbid. And they would are poor. We would have to take care of them. After 1905, the sense was that these poor Jews are also Bolsheviks, so they would steal problems for Britain as a whole and the Jewish community at it. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, it's quite incredible to go back to the material itself and to see it word by word written in explaining to British policymakers, German policymakers, and so on, this is good for Europe because we don't want the poor East European Jews to come to the West or to the United States when I started talking, uh, looking for the origins of uh, uh, the pro-Zionist lobby in, in the United States. So uh, this is important because, again, it sounds like a distant chapter in the past, but it's very much a relevant issue today, isn't it? I mean, the whole uh, uh, connection between uh, the Anglo-Jewish community and uh, Israel, and this whole uh, walking on eggshells when we start, we, we begin to talk earnestly and honestly and actually on, against racism, not because we are racist, that you cannot be an ambassador, an ambassadress for Israel and at the same time claim that all you care is for the uh, interests of the Anglo-Jewish community and anybody who, wo who points out to, to this kind of connection is immediately branded as an anti-Semite or in my case as a self-hating Jew. This is something that we should not be afraid to talk about because this is very, very important. I won't mention name, but if you are familiar with what goes on in the Labour Party now, a full lobbyist for uh, Israel is going to be one of the most powerful member of the uh, Labour Party. Uh, I don't want to, to get into names. It's not important. The name is not important. What is important that for 100 years, people who were part of the organization 
of the lobbying for Zionism, later for Israel, also played a very important role in British politics. And so no contradiction in representing the interests of a foreign country and a, and a foreign state and a state that commits uh, crimes against uh, humanity and war crimes, and at the same time serving as civil servants or politicians of, of Britain. Everybody says, well, when you're going into this, you are going into the territory of conspiracies, and that leads us to the old accusations of anti-Semitism against the Jews. No, this is why we write books like this. This is why we insist that this is a scholarly work, pedantic work, that is not falling into any conspiracy theories, is just examining the evidence in history to show that this is a connection that is problematic, not just for the Palestinians, but also for the Jews in Britain. And they, I think we have now a younger generation, at least of American Jews, who fully comprehend and understand this problem, and fully uh, uh, acknowledge that this has not served well the American Jewish community to be uh, uh, the ambassadors and ambassadress uh, for Israel, and they just jettisoned their connection to Zionism, and many of them feel that in order to show where they are today, they also want to take full part in the solidarity movement with the Palestinians, so not just saying Judaism is not Zionism. Our Judaism puts us in the forefront in the struggle for liberation and freedom uh, uh, in, in Palestine. A third point that I wanted, and I, I follow your, your clock very carefully here, so keep it alive. <laughs> <It's> a, <coughs> it helps me. Um, I used to think that socialism or social democracy and labor movement in Britain would go together with universal values that I cherish human rights, civil rights, workers' rights. And it's only when I went into the history of the Labour Party before the creation of the State of Israel, and especially in the early years of statehood, when the Labour Friends of Israel were established in the early 1950s, that I realized how important was this today, I think, we'll call it gaslighting, you know, this social democratic gaslighting. What do I mean by this? You have really the, the pillars of British socialism, really the pillars of British socialism, who, for instance, would definitely condemn apartheid in South Africa, fully supporting Israel to the extent that any attempt to show as Radha and her friends would, uh, uh, any sympathy, empathy, a wish to represent, with the Palestinians, a wish to represent the Palestinian cause, would immediately be destroyed by these particular leaders of socialism in Britain. It's, it gives you some kind of a more profound and deeper understanding for the Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, or the attack on Jeremy Corbyn. It's not a new phenomenon. There are roots there of, of social democrats, by the way, not only in Britain, in Europe as a whole, providing a shield of immunity to Zionism in the name of social democratic principles. This is far worse than the, new, than the right-wing support for Israel. The, right, the fascist right-wing support that Israel enjoys today and maybe enjoyed a bit in the past, is easy to challenge, is easy to deal with, because you immediately say, you see who the allies are of this state, who is the allies of this ideology. But when the ideology that uh, is being mentioned and quoted to explain why Israel is supported is one that you can identify with as a human being, uh, then it becomes a bit more complicated. And it was very difficult, I think, for anybody challenging the, the support for Zionism and support for Israel when it came from either liberal or social democrat uh, uh, circles. And, and I wasn't aware of this, how deep it went into the Labour Party, even before the creation of the Conservative Friends of Israel, who are now the most impo important lobby for Israel in Britain, but how important the Labour Friends of Israel, not to mention the specific outfits 
that joined the TUC, the Trade Union Council. The trade unions in Britain were uh, giving affiliation to pre-state Zionist organization whose role was before 1948 to advocate for Zionism, but the is Israel did not dismantle them because it turned it into part of the lobbying for Zionism in, in, for Israel in Britain. So you had pure Zionist organization having full affiliation and membership in the TUC, while any attempt to even create, a, at the beginning, a solidarity uh, circle with the Palestinians in the trade unions was rejected as political and unacceptable. Un unbelievable if you go back to it. And this is a time when people already visited Palestine and Israel. It was at the time when people began to understand what was going on. Of course, it became a bit more difficult when it was easier to visit and easier to get information what was going on. But even then, it was not yet over for the Labour Party to show unconditional support for oppression, apartheid, colonization, ethnic cleansing, and nowadays, to not to speak openly and bravely about the genocide in Palestine. Shame on them and shame on this leadership that doesn't even have one word to say. But it has an historical uh, root uh, uh, for this, and I think it's very important. Finally, I think that uh, I want also to be optimistic, because it's very clear that what I was talking about up, up to now is a huge, powerful alliance, first included Britain, then the United States, then multinational corporation. The Palestinians really, I mean, were facing an alliance so powerful economically, politically, strategically, and it's all focused on the idea of this project of displacement and replacement, displacing the Palestinians and replacing them. It's, it's, it's almost incredible that they're still there, fighting, showing resilience and resistance. This is also what my book taught me once and more, once more, that how how unbelievable is the fact that Palestine and the Palestinians are still there? It's not taken for granted. But what brings me hope, and for me hope, I want to explain that nobody misunderstand what I mean for me. Hope for me is the end of Israel and the creation of a free Palestine from the river to the sea. What brings me hope is the fact that uh, the powerful lobby and the alliance were very effective when it comes to politics from above. They, from the very early on, they understand that all they have to do is follow politicians at the early stages of their career, making sure that they are allies in a later stage in their career, using money, influence, uh, uh, intimidation if needed, in order to get whether the American or the British political system to abide by their demands. However, they find it very difficult and always found it very difficult to deal with the civil society. They know, don't know how to deal with alternative media today. They have no idea how to deal with it. They don't know how to deal with civil society, with communal action, with boycott initiatives, with divestment initiatives. All their methodology, all the weaponry, that they, all the armory that they have is useless, it seems, against people. That should give us hope. And the hope is that probably this is not the only issue uh, in which the politicians of this particular era are not representing us well. I don't remember as an historian at an age like this when politics, and I'm generalizing, of course, that politicians were of such a low caliber, <laughs> intellectually, morally, corrupt, shallow, reductionist, people who have very little to offer their society apart from their own careers. It doesn't matter which party. It's really uh, a, 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 the age of, of the, 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 the lack of any status for the politicians. So their ideas of how to deal with global warming, how to deal with poverty, how to deal with issues that really trouble people are not very interesting and are not very successful. 
and are not very effective because they don't care about these issues. They care about their own careers. It's not surprising that also their ideas about Palestine are irrelevant and are harmful and negative. So we should hope that when people struggle against this lobby, they're also struggling against lobby, other lobbies that make their life miserable and, un and disable them to solve problems of poverty, ecological danger, injustices in society beyond the question of Palestine. I think this explains why so many people are galvanized behind the Palestine question as symbolizing struggle against injustices anywhere else in the world as well. And Palestine is an indication that there is a different kind of politics that we would wish for ourselves, for our next generations. And that's why so many hopes are pinned on the Palestinian liberation movement, sometimes probably un even unreasonably, actually, that Palestine would be the, you know, the paragon state that all the other failed decolonized world uh, was unable to, to fulfill. But it explains, because this is an, a demand for a different kind of politicians and a different kind of the idea, what is universal justice? This is the big challenge the ICJ and the ICC are having. It's not a, it's not a, a coincidence that for the first time, they at least provided a stage for what people think about Palestine and not governments, if you think about it. And they did it intentionally. I talked with them, some of them. They did it intentionally. They wanted to show that tribu international tribunals are also listening to people, not just to the politics of power. Hopefully, this is just the beginning of a process that would lead for a better world, first of all, for the Palestinians, and then for all of us. Thank you. Okay.